We thought the tide was turning at the end of the decade, but the fundamentals were overwhelmed by U.S.-China trade tensions and a little something called COVID. Something far more powerful than Captain Hook's crocodile has this wave of EM's clock ticking pretty loudly right now. So the question is, why have emerging markets been a disappointment for the last decade, and what's causing this recent rise in the space? We're going to find out right now on UBS Trending. Hi, everyone, and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm your host, Anthony Pastore. I'm joined here today by Charlie Wilson to have an enlightening conversation about what's going on within the EM space. Charlie, it's really good to have you here. Um, I said right in the intro that we've seen a little bit of disappointment in the EM, and I'm, I'm imagining you agree with that versus developed markets, especially over the last decade or so. Absolutely. It's been a very tough decade, and I and, you know, want to be completely honest about that. But I'm also here to tell a story about why things could be a little bit better Great. going forward. Yeah, and one of the things I will say is our, our chief investment office here at UBS also uh, is uh, most preferred on EM right now. They see uh, uh, lots of opportunity there in international as well. Before we get into that, though, what was going on in the last decade or so with EM that it was such a disappointment? Yeah, frankly, there's been multiple moving parts. Um, if you go back to the end of the 2000s, that, that was really a growth model in EM that was driven by fixed asset investment, so investment in infrastructure. It was commodity driven. It was also uh, driven by a global trade boom. Frankly, where gro global trade for, for nearly two decades was growing much faster than it ever has. And that was really taking advantage of the low cost labor base that we find in emerging markets. When you look at the opportunities that have now come from like today, now that we're past that decade, is it mostly driven by what's going on with that reopening of China? Because there are so many, uh, you know, really, if you, I mean, it's, it's got a wide reach, you know, to travel and tourism in Southeast Asia, to even Latin American countries, and even into, even though it's not all EM, into Europe. So what's driving this growth we're starting to see? Well, I think there's a couple of things. You know, one of the things that EM has been dealing with, besides what I just mentioned in right. terms of, like a shift in the growth drivers, is the fact that developed markets have had zero or very low interest rates for most of the last decade, which really made equities in developed markets quite attractive. Yeah, that and easy so, money certainly yeah, was I a mean, big deal. You know, there, there wasn't really another alternative, right? But now people are saying cost of capital normalizing in developed markets, hey, we should look elsewhere. And, and frankly, EM has navigated markets like what we're seeing right now in their history. They're used to volatility. They're used to higher rates. They're used to higher levels of inflation. And they're navigating this pretty, pretty well, um, mainly because of lessons they learned in past lessons. Right. And, and we, you, know, you can't really talk about anything with the markets these days without talking about central banks. I mean, the ECB has a big job ahead of them and closer to home. Certainly, Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve do as well. And with all this that's been going on with the banks and um, you know, worries over that, there's even some calls for now the Fed looking to, you know, they want the Fed to cut rates by 100 basis points by the end of the year, which as of a few days ago, it was flat to the end of the year. How much might that impact your view of EM or what might happen within the EM space? Yeah, obviously, having easy global liquidity again is helpful for equity market mm -hmm. or markets in general. Um, EM benefits from that as money tries to find a home. Um, but I would say, you know, really normalizing the U.S. cost of capital is frankly more important to them because it, it does make EM on a relative basis a bit more attractive. And like I said, I, you know, EM does have, know how to navigate markets like this. And so there's very little concern about a crisis of a similar nature happening in emerging markets because they just don't have the capability to backstop things the same way that developed markets can. Right. Yeah. And what about Ukraine, Russia? That's obviously a concern. Geopolitical yeah. tensions are certainly something to think about when it comes to the emerging markets you know, yeah. world. Yeah, I mean, with, with Russia now out of the index, the direct exposure is a little bit different. But obviously, there are knock-on impacts. And I would say you know, one of the biggest from an EM perspective are the disruptions to uh, commodity supply chains, which, which could lead to higher commodity prices. Even though commodities is not the main growth driver for EM anymore, um, it's, there's still uh, major parts of the EM universe that, that still are commodity exporters and do benefit from higher commodity prices. Right. One yeah. of the things CIO, our REM team, says here is that that kind of blanket risk on, risk off maybe isn't the right way to go these days just because it is a little nuanced and a little regionalized when you look at the opportunities. Where do you actually see some of those particular opportunities within EM? Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. You know, if you think about the Chinese economy today, which, like I said, in the past was driven by global trade and that labor arbitrage. 
I would say it's evolved substantially over the last decade. And really, we're seeing a lot of middle class consumption growth in China. Mm. Uh, and that's happening, that's happening broadly across the EM, but there's a really large part of it happening in China. And what, that, what that's doing is transitioning the Chinese economy less to be less tied with the global economy and more towards the unique uh, Chinese economy drivers. What about um, when you're looking at, say, this sort of shifting model for EM, what, what are some of the new drivers that you see, Charlie, maybe going forward? I mean, I think the most important trend, honestly, is this middle class consumer. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about consumption in emerging markets for decades and, and kind of always been waiting for that to happen. And just having a lot of people is not enough to really drive consumption. Um, what we've seen evolve over the last decade is, is a nearly tripling of the middle class in emerging markets, and that's expected to double again and be close to 50% of the global middle class by the end of this decade. And the important part about that is now you have enough money in enough people's pockets that they can actually go after you know, higher value services or, or, or luxury goods or, or their first time a home or auto, and that really changes the investment pr perspective for EM. And just shifting back to China for a second, uh, this reopening trade that they've had. And uh, obviously, we're really positive on that here, too, because it has such far-reaching impacts. How important is that continuance of that China reopening trade and this kind of revenge travel that people are talking about yeah. and all this money that's been sitting yeah. on the sidelines for three years while people have been trapped home with COVID or the restrictions that were there? How much does that continuing really actually, in your view, help push EM forward? Well, I, I think it's very important for China. And I want to separate. I think there's, there's a part of EM that's really developing that's somewhat independent of China. Mm -hmm. But I do think for, for global uh, risk appetite, it's important that China continues to rec recover. I would say probably the easy money in China has been made at this point. We've seen the, the, uh, the rebound from oversold conditions last October to where we are today, where we've started to price in a bit of a recovery. But I would say, uh, um, I would say expectations are still too low because China was basically locked down last year. It's going to be pretty easy to, for them to meet their growth objectives. I wouldn't be surprised if they exceed it. And ultimately, I think earnings estimates are still too low. And you can see a real follow through in the Chinese markets. And we're still pretty optimistic about, about further opportunities. Right, so there's still, still yeah. more opportunity potentially yeah, happening yeah, within sure. the China, yeah. with China landscape. Yes. That's terrific. So with, you know, with Fed tightening, well, who knows if it's still going to happen. I mean, we have a Fed meeting in, in a couple of days. Nobody really knows at this point what they're going to do. But say they go into the 25, and if they actually hold rates steady, knowing that that's coming, what, were, what would you say is the takeaway for investors today when they're looking at opportunities within EM? Uh, actually, I think this is one of the most important points, is that in the past, central banks and emerging markets were, were, behind, were behind the Fed. And they learned the hard way that that wasn't possible. They saw their currencies uh, have a lot of volatility and usually did the downside. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very uncomfortable period for them. And, and so by taking those past lessons, they've been ahead of the curve during this inflation uh, cycle. And, and you, what you're seeing is the highest real rates in the world are in emerging markets. And last year, currencies were relatively stable in emerging markets. Developed markets is where you saw more depreciation versus the dollar. And so I think that actually if, if the Fed were to go on hold, that leaves central banks and emerging markets some room to actually start to cut. And so many emerging markets are expected to start cutting rates at the end of the year. Terrific. Charlie, thank you very much. Great rundown. And uh, thanks for joining us. It's a really important topic and obviously one that we here at UBS also agree with you on. So good to see you. Great, Charlie Wilson from Thornburg. Thanks, everybody, for staying with us. And for more information on anything we spoke about today and the things that are coming out of our chief investment office, visit our website at ubs.com forward slash views and follow us on social media. We just recently relaunched our Instagram page called UBS Trending. You can check it out for some of our greatest hits and promos and other guidance and information that will help you with your investing life. And in the meantime, if you have any questions about your own portfolio or anything that Charlie and I spoke about today, make sure to reach out to your financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. We hope you have a great rest of your day and remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.